and the control is like, oh yes, fine, thank you very much. And Resin, thank you very much for all of you for coming. It's uh, it's great to be here. I've uh, added the extra word on the title to and management to sort of think a bit more about it being just about science in the past, but more about what real people will do in the real world and how we move from this period of stuff coming down the road as things we could do to things that people will do uh, in terms of the, of the uh, Huge technology. So it's literally the question is, is this. Uh, and Paul John, I was at the um, uh, Society of Range Management um, conference in Denver last week and I asked those top two questions about some of the kit we've been doing. Um, I'm thinking a bit about that, but now I want a bit more, which I want to ask you about, hopefully in discussion. Um, you know, where's this all going to? Where will it end? Where will it, where will it start in terms of real people doing this, this sort of stuff on the ground? Because we've heard so much about what might be, well, we now move into the period of doubt with in working careers around the <coughs> Let's see where we're at. So, make sure we get the right thing. So, that's, that's me, whatever. So, yeah, it's a pleasure to be involved in this project and to greatly acknowledge this project and to learn the first stage of it and have a look at the visit of it. Where's it going? Well, the only way is clearly go. Um, <laughs> up to where is the question. I'm hoping we can look at what may be the top of this poll shortly, but clearly that's what these people are. They may be looking for some sort of intervention from somewhere. <laughs> Country um, with a very different sort of environment, but the, the, the things are the same in terms of our extensive systems, in terms of poor quality grazing, a different sort of harsh weather. We measure bit of that. Few, few old fences and all that sort of stuff. Infrequent inspection of animals, typically quite high losses, you know, un, 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 abnormal for, for ruminants, uh, for cows, higher losses than would be acceptable in the intensive systems and certainly the less. Um, so we, we work in an environment where there's an issue about the sheep have lower value than the cattle, um, you know, and how do you trade them off? I think now I've learned we've, we've all got labour issues, you know, it's just how do people use their own time? And pertinent to this whole issue of, of precision stuff is, is communication routes of getting data from the ground to the, to the smartphone are quite challenging and it's probably one of the areas that's going to make the biggest difference to how we can make it make things work. And again, a little bit of an afterthought that we tend to think about the animals and the kit and all stuff, but actual fact, the whole of this, is, this these sort of extensive systems aren't about all that. I mean, mainly about the people involved. It's the people that will make the difference on the, on the ground, and don't forget that, and when we get all worried about technology. So, just a little bit my, about my history, and a bit about this sort of group of people we work with. It's kind of often thought that extensive farmers around the world are slow to change and don't like technology. Uh, this just shows us encompasses some of my, my working history on the left. When I first came to the research station where I am, one of the first things I was involved in was bringing in ultrasonic pregnancy counting of lambs. Um, I tried to do the job on the left, I'm a terrible picture of slides, that's interesting. So counting the number of lambs inside using neutral. We wrote one of the first papers on that back in 1986. Um, and actually looked at those false alarm issues, which I'll talk about later. So, the point was that over 50% of the farmers in the UK picked up that technology incredibly quickly because it worked. It did that. It worked and it paid. 50% tried it. No, another percent tried it and they said, no, no, we will, we will, we will, we will push it in. We don't need to know whether we've got triplets versus twins. They're the same thing. But those that liked twins versus singles liked it. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of technology that's now so old that we think it's been around forever, but we yeah, we had to bring it in, so we were amongst the first people to brought that in, and, and, and surely it, it had issues. On the right, it's just again the fashion that the farms can change things incredibly quickly. So, bottom right is a picture of a modernish Aberdeen Angus, I believe you'd be very aware of, and it's about that big as a bull, always about a ton, whatever, not the biggest breed. During my working life, smoking cows at home, that's a cycle of the, of the Aberdeen Angus then in Scotland. Basically, you could put them in a rabbit hutch and uh, <laughs> and be fine. And somewhere in 15 to 25 generations, they also become those. Now, you say farmers can't do things, they can do things when they want to. How to get a few genes back from maybe Canada and New Zealand that were shipped abroad. And there might be a bit of lumbers in there as well, but nobody can, yeah, but you don't, you don't know what's going on. But, anyway, but that's just the way population of animals change. Whenever it's how many animals, how many animals, how many animals, well, they're a completely different animal now. Some people call them black cherries. Right? 
So a few, a few bits of numbers here, just to kind of give you a context of where we fit in. So I'm going to give you a little bit of story about Scotland, UK, beef and cattle, beef cattle and stuff. So worldwide numbers there, 1.4 billion cattle in the world. We've got 182,000-ish dairy cows and roughly three times more beef cattle, um, which is different from the rest of the UK. And we've got quite a lot of breeding sheep, two and a half million breeding ewes on a relatively small area of land. And there's a land picture just again hi highlighting some of the issues about how Scotland is. It's, it's got lower level of woodland, 18% than much of the rest of the, the planet, but we've got a large area of grassland, and on the grassland, a lot of it is something you would define as rangeland. So roughly 50% of Scotland is covered in something you would call rangeland rough grazing, which is again abnormal for much of the rest of the planet. So uh, it's really quite important to 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 our terrains and whatever. So a little bit of a picture here. Um, I, my colleague John's on the, on the other end of the line. He will know that's not in Scotland. <laughs> I <laughs> can't achieve. But that's a quite a good picture, sort of showing a little bit about our upland range systems and how they work. Um, and um, in that picture, we've got centuries of, of management of the lowland pastures with, with good soils. With lots of animal grazing with lots of manures on them. I and mean, then beyond the line on, on, on the wall, we've got up, up unfenced hillsides that are basically your rangeland, our hill grazing. And a completely different set of stuff happening above them. So the individual, there's three or four farms you can see down there in the, or maybe more than that, in the bottom land there. Um, and each have got segments of fields and then they've got a share of the hill. Based on there and based on things. So in that picture, we could have, and I know there's a limousine cattle farm in the, on the left hand corner. We may have three, four hundred cattle, mainly in the bottom fields. There may be, I don't know, two thousand sheep on the under our feet and on the far valley there. But there could have be been actually five hundred tourists as well. So how all that works is something I'm saying. I think it's everything. many of the stone walls there will be older than the United States of America. So we've been making mistakes a lot longer than you guys. <laughs> So this is the picture of our farm with myself and John is on the other end of the line work um, and where we've done our much of our research work showing a similar picture, high quality grassland down the bottom and a hill left going backwards up the way to about um, just over a thousand meters. So it's quite a difference, it's not it's quite a gradation. So we again in those situations we have both sheep grazing all the around, but cattle using sort of seasonal grazing being quite typical. Again, from a labour point of view, just again get your head around that, the back of the farm is over the back of there, no fences. So if somebody can go and solve a problem from here, can drive for half an hour, park, walk for an hour and a half to, to walk out and walk back, bringing a sick animal back would take maybe four or five hours, something of that order. So it's not an easy operation, no different from, and anybody thinks about taking a horse out, they might get the horse out, but they wouldn't get the horse back. I think it's simplistic so because the ground is too, too wet. So, so, Sheep, the big, big issue in our country, we, we, sheep are the main use of our upland pasture, so we'll mention a bit about them. There's one with a, with a deep guest collar around its neck, so that's the Scottish blackfish breed. They're very dispersed grazers, they spread out. We've been looking at some deep guest data for these things. <laughs> sheep on our farm, uh, we slept together and they, they, they open the back of the truck and they just spread out as much as they can. They don't form a, a, a flock like other breeds and other places around the world, and they are relatively shepherded. In terms of what you do with them, what is your kill systems? They are seen only when they're gathered in. Many of them lie on the hill completely unassisted. The next time they're brought in is two months later with dogs into the handling pens, and that's when they get looked at. So if things go wrong, back, uh, and just an indication of what the, what the vegetation looks like at the moment. Um, there will be snow on the ground, more as you go further up, but the vegetation is very full digestible. So we have a hard winter when the sheep are pregnant. But then because we have really fantastic long days in the summer, we have really good, really, really good growth when the, when the growth turns up. Cattle, by contrast, these are the breed called the Ling, um, which is a composite breed between the Highland cow and the dairy show home, for those who understand that sort of thing. They are a sort of more of a hardy hill breed, not a, not a very long coat, but they would typically be summer grazers on the hill. Or maybe winter on bits of a hill, but with often usually with, with extra supplements as well. By contrast, we have lowland breeds more like the limousine here, same with the collar again, 
that would often be used as a crossing route on the boat now to give you a higher quality animal. Another we breed we have as our Edinburgh farm is some Charleys, again, and we've had we've, we've grazed cattle like this on our hills and see what we do. And here are some black highland cows with bones that are too wide to get in the abattoir. So these cattle were sent away by the forest machine, looked after these cattle, they sent them away to have them slaughtered, and this, the abattoir said, no, we, we, we're not accepting them because we can't get them into the slaughterhouse. It's born too wide for the, the race. So they came back and they're going to. They're going to they're pets of the forest for this okay, we know nothing about farming. <laughs> Real farmers will they have to look after them and they, this is again in case of the sort of mess you can get in the environment when you've got wet or conditions with cattle being fed in this environment from sand. So to move on. We do a little bit harder breeds, these are Galloway breeds, hairy, no holes. Yeah. And again we have quite extensive pastures which are sometimes used by cattle in the winter period as well. We have nice castles to show off for you tourists if you're yet happy. And, uh, and the like of that. So again, you can see the land going above us, grazed by, grazed by, by sheep. Uh, and there, here, this is a, a near where our research farm is, where again, the whole country there is mainly grazed by wild deer. Lovely, <coughs> lovely place in the winter. Very variable. <coughs> so the animals that compete and interact with our hill cattle and the hill sheep are wild red deer, which is shot as the sport and they're otherwise quite a good thing to manage. And these things, which aren't just about whiskey, which is the labels on the whiskey bottle, is red grass, which again is managed for very high populations that can be shot by people, usually with quite a lot of money. So they have quite an impact on the landscape. The new landscape is this we've got, I don't know how many wind farms we've got, but we must have more, near 50 than five in terms of the scale of them. And uh, they cover quite large areas of our more rounded hills. So that picture there is where we may be moving to, so on the left here, wind turbines, but there's a, a group of cattle, black cattle, on this farm, sheep in the field, it's a little, little bit late, so that's a nice modern and new. So the question is, you know, will those animals still be there in 50 years time, and for them still to be there, will they need the stock technology here, which is all and should have GPS collars on them, will that be part of the story of all the time, being there, questions. Right. Why do we want technology in this environment? Um, it's interesting. I mean, the simple thing is, where are they? So there is a picture of some cattle on a neighbouring farm, and to find them, we have to get closer to them. To get closer to them, you've got to go. Typically, traditionally, it would be accepted to what good ethics and welfare to see these cattle every day, even just to count them to make sure everything's okay. They aren't. They aren't. They haven't got their legs in the air. In any form or fashion, and they will form a herd typically. But to get in here from the next door farm, I don't know how long it will take, but it's, it's over an hour, typically, and then back just to check them. We may be checking from the car back here, we've been up to this, but it's quite a problem. Again, just to give you a view that that's somewhere else in Europe, that's the Spanish Pyrenees side, um, in the Odessa Gorge, which is the top end of this. And to walk from down here to where the cattle are, you see the cattle, can you? No, fine. Yeah. So they're tucked away in there. Again, it's about two and a half hours walk. Okay, I think we use a bike there to, to be easy, but it's still been, and there's not been really to stop these cows walking to France, <coughs> except for quite, quite a steep walking path. So that's a problem throughout the whole of, of our uplands throughout the world, is just like If we look at the, the story of precision stuff, then a lot of it in cattle has been driven from the intensive systems. Pigs and poultry are providing some of it, but the dairy end of it here is, is something again you can see on the left. We've got milking machines, automatic milkers, whatever. On this bottom left, you can see a, a tag there, this white tag there. Um, uh, that's called Smart Ball. It's made in Switzerland. It's on quite a lot of farms. I, how many farms do you ask somebody? 400 is a number I got back as a guess from somebody. Uh, and what that does is give you a map of where the cows are in the shed, so you can find them. And you've got hundreds of cows, and you get an alert saying cow 474 is not feeling too good. How do you find them? Via yeah, map. Um, this thing on this thing on this massive of data as well, in terms of individual, you know, things about health, things, things about milk, whatever, and all that sort of stuff. So that's driving that. That's that's one of the sensors we've been using both inside these sheds. But also in our extensive system, to turn this a, 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 mo a motion center. Okay. So some of this is coming down the road from this end, in that we can now 
do issue detection, issue detection by, by accelerometer, by neckband. I think it's now the accepted best method. Humans basically are not as good as this. So, look, so now students coming through college are being told, this is the way to go. Let's know how, know how to do it observation wise, but moving on. And the question is, how much do we move that into to extensive pastures? Again, give you a feel some of the things happening in our other half of our SRUC house. Just again, these are sort of some of our, our indoor house facilities near Edinburgh. Um, some of the stuff I like some involved with individual feeding bins in here, chambers to put individual cattle in to measure methane. So, but linking back to basically feedlot um, based systems, but we'd have cows going through as well because a lot of our cows are housed in the winter. So, we need to know about efficiencies and all that sort of stuff. There's quite a lot of work going on in that area. And feeding through some of the technology in my own, our own, our own research groups, looking at net centers. Ample sensors, Ruby watchy type things, looking at tags in terms of identification. Here's something again looking at heart rate in calves, uh, then camera based stuff, uh, thermal imaging, outdoor wear next to a either a weight we trough with a, a solar panel there so we can actually monitor animals out pasture. Mm -hmm. Same kit in the side. And there's, our, there's some of our work down the bottom right. Where even though I'm talking about beef, we quite like sheep. To do this all work because basically sheep, you can work with sheep, you can you can you can, you can discuss things with sheep. <laughs> uh, cows just break things, <laughs> don't they? So I'm going to talk a bit now about this connecting technologies and how we and just some illustrative stuff, some of which I talked about last week at Denver. Just take you through some of the data and say where we're at. So this is some of the data we we've been working with. Just some of it, quite a lot more, um, but sort of moving towards from the top, which is about communication. To the bottom, which is the sort of let's put it all together in a, in a pack. So we'll see what happens. So just for a break in my thought, can I can I just ask you so? This, for those not listening on the other end around, we've got about twenty people in the room. So of the twenty people in the room, can I ask those who are willing to volunteer to who's wearing a uh, Fitbit type motion sensor? Anybody? Got one. Who's wearing a two? Who's got, who's wearing a watch? Who's not wearing a watch? How do you tell the time? <laughs> who's, who's wearing a GPS tracker? Who's carrying a GPS tracker? <laughs> and who's, who's carrying a motion sensor? Yeah. Some of you know the answer to all these things, aren't you? Because obviously, wherever it is, <laughs> yeah, Big Brother knows exactly where we are all the time and knows what we're doing and not what we're doing. So in, inside here, we've got all that kit that's, that's out, helping along with this whole thing in terms of all. We've got all the motion sensors, all got. GPS in it, whether you turn it on or off. <coughs> um, all got proximity sensors in them as well. What they haven't yet got is virtual fencing. But it's next. <laughs> and obviously geofencing is, uh, is, is part of the language that the general population are doing in terms of thinking about getting alerts when their children or their granny moves outside of an allocate area by using, using this equipment. So it's just a, it's something we need to, well it's coming, it's how do we get into the, into the really rural environments where we're at? So, the question is, is this interesting? The work that you've been doing for years, it's really interesting. It's fascinating. It's, 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 it ends up, well, is it useful? Well, yes, it is useful, but how, how much does it influence what ranchers really do on a day to day basis? It, it, truthfully, it's, 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 a, it's the background stuff. Are we moving where this technology starts to be the thing that starts to be the thing that drives their lives? The same way as that mobile phone you're carrying around is probably now. Thing that synchronizes your lives, will it be the same way when we start bringing that into farming? So, the key to that is can we get data off it to the user, the end user, the farmer, <coughs> the rancher? Can it be informed? Can, can, can we manage things better before or after? The key thing is for the environment conditions you work in and we work in, and when we're working with animals that basically want to break everything, is you know, are they robust enough to work and last for five or ten years so that they can be paid off? And then we're getting the cost benefits and all that sort of stuff, which we'll pick up in a minute. So, will real time stuff, as opposed to mark on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an SD card or, or store on board, is the right word, be transformational? Well, I, I'd be surprised it's not, but I'm not sure when and if, and that's what we're going to do. I'm interested, in, obviously, in your views as to how that would go. So, we've been playing with some of that. So, the first thing we've, we've, we've put on that list is 
is LoRa, which is a sort of communication route that we're using. Let's go back to a slightly simpler picture, which I've stolen off the internet off, off one of the virtual fence people, but this is quite useful. So the, the key issue is getting data between the animal, the cow, and the and the end user. I'm sure the rancher there could be in the next door field or on the beach in, in Honolulu. You know, the question is that that's that's not the issue, is how do we get from there to there? And how do we get data from there and, and back and forward? So here's the poll. So um, what we've got to get data, in this case GPS data to the cow. That's mature technology. This stuff going there and back isn't mature technology. We're all learning our way through it. There are basically three methods I'm aware of that look like they're going to work in reality. First is more the cell phone stuff. Cell phones are out in the um, GSM where we can actually go to, in essence into the into the mobile phone thing. You can just use satellites for that, but otherwise just a normal network and go direct from the cloud to the to the to the to a computing cloud. Uh, we may be seeing low Earth orbit satellites. Even Elon Musk and SpaceX are proposing to put 10,000 things the size of a suitcase into the low Earth atmosphere. But they again were charging data users. Or the other one, which is the one that a lot of us are using now, this we can do it, and it's using cheap ish technology, is, is, uh, uh, is low power radio of one form of fashion, which LoRa, LoRa, <laughs> slightly, slightly, slightly different, but the same, is the opportunity to use um, open source. Stuff to allow getting data from the cow by sort of line of sight up to you know 100 meters, but maybe 100 kilometers, 100 miles maybe is the furthest extent, and then from there to the cloud, and then from the cloud back to the user, and then the user can do something with it and then send the data back and do something on the other end. That's the that's the thing. So, what's the weakest part of that of that pitch? Do you think? Where's your weakest link? The line of sight. Line, you think that's the line of sight? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the challenging bits of something to be all covered at the moment. Yeah. Any more thoughts? I mean, I know the, the weakest link is this person here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fundamentally, isn't it? What they're going to do with it? But technically, you're right. I think at the moment, we know this is mature technology. You know, it's a bit wobbly, and this is mature technology. Even what's on the carriage, to sat or whatever, it's easy. It's an, it's a motion sensor. But it's actually the computing in the cloud that ends all the communication out. And that, and that, that bit can be kept. It's probably the bit that's the most challenging in terms of making it, it work. But it's all the stuff we're working at within when we're in the field field, away from a Wi Fi signal. And what, that's what makes extensive systems different. I was talking before Christmas, early, early autumn in the, in the, the conference in Cork, um, on the European Conference on Precision Livestock Farming. 260 papers, the four of us, I think, which I was two, talking about outside, outside. The rest were how to count chickens in the shed type scenarios where you could use an essence Wi Fi or, or similar. Where there was someone moving out here, it's quite interesting in, in, in Denver, posted on this stuff. We're all, oh, we do, we're using law. I'm going, oh, there are people all out there trying to do it because it, it is a moment, one of the main shows in town. But not easy. A little bit of pictures about that going on too. We've got some, we've got a kit that goes into from, a, from, a, from an aerial outside into the internet via a wire, via an ethernet cable, one that's, that's working at the moment in the yard, uh, not as well as it should, in terms of working off grid without power, but again, it's pushing the data back up into the, the cloud system using the mobile phone network. And again, relatively cheap uh, compared to the, the likes of you have to. Send things by text message or something like that. A lot of the kit that's using the wildlife is using text messages or satellite phones, and that's quite expensive. You know the story about the, the eagle that flew from one of the former Russian states into Iran, and it basically then lost its roaming charges and it bankrupted the institute that was basically suddenly uh, <laughs> the roaming charge went up from one dollar a day to. Hundred thousand, you know, thousand dollars a day, and basically just you know, it, 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 the, the eagle basically jumped up the border, and, and I turned my uh, all those things off. So there we are, a nice picture again of our farm looking from the side, from a from a from a UAV shot, and you can see where we're at. So we've got one gateway in the farm here, another gateway outside the farm, and the nearest other place where we've got a a wire into a domestic Wi-Fi to give us coverage, and that gives us an overlapping coverage that allows all that. And the aim is to basically put a couple of these other off-grid 
kit kit up here so it can look both into the back of the farm and then down to give us a much better coverage. That looks immensely harder to work with than the system that you're going to have here, but you're going to find out, aren't you? Yeah, just how hard it is. Bizarrely flat and a little bit undulating, maybe harder than quite a lot of bumps and lumps where we've got mountains that the signal can bounce off. So we've, we've again had an amazing amount of success going over hillocks in the road, the, the height of this building. And who, sorry, hillocks in the, in, the, in the field. We've actually, how does that work? It works by a sort of bendy line of sight. Uh, when elsewhere people have struggled with the same, the same technology. So we've got a number of uh, other centres working today out there looking at river levels and soil and water temperature, all working on, on battery based systems that are kicking out and they'll last for a year or, or longer in terms of the capacity to, to push data into the system and come back into a gateway on to be on my phone now I can look at the look at the data now. So that would be great. What the question is, where will we have all two and a half thousand sheep? coming in and the 50 so cows are cattle that are on that farm and maybe once just interesting. So I'm just kicking up some of that stuff. So again this is actually more about more than about GPS. We're using GPS as an example. The tri tri clear critical issue is you can't solve a problem on these sort of farms unless you know where it is. And therefore location data is absolutely critical and, and I think to be fair location created data can tell you something itself be that question for me. But we just we've tried for the same sort of stuff, dots on maps and stuff, and uh, using this Laura set of those colours and the, the, it's over that bump there and down a bit and over a bit to where the actual area was. And it was working. A little bit of data you might want to look at, but just again, this issue about how do you get data back and what does it mean? What's critical things that people want to know when they get a bit of data back, maybe want to know, is where it is. And if it's on an open range. 100 meter resolution could be fine, but if they're in a field with no system that I show you, you know it's in field two, not field three, and it's quite critical. So this is really some simple data that shows that more often you need to do two things. One is to look over a longish time interval, but also be prepared to look at more data than just one one point to actually get accuracy. So we can go from 21% of the animals of the fish being outside the fence. In the wrong field because they lie on the front line, down to one in a row, whatever, point no, not one percent is by fiddling with the data by roll, doing a rolling average or putting a buffer up just to give you a way of sort of doing it. The way that your GPS signal keeps you on the, the freeway when in theory it thinks you're in the road below, but it doesn't say, oh, you, you got off the road. It, it, remind, it remembers you're supposed to be on the freeway for a while. But it just demonstrates again that, that this data isn't just a simple matter of one dot on a map every day. It has to be something more than that. But what I would just want to show is some, sorry, just something about its reliability. Just showing uh, one of our colleagues, uh, husband is going for a, a big walk. He's a member of the mountain, mountain, mountain rescue. So he, walked, he, he drove his car from the farm here three, four miles, parked his car down here, then walked up along this ridge around the back of here onto the top of that mountain there, which is in winter, it's a mountain mountain. In summer, it's a nice, nice, nice big walk. And there's, there's his GPS plotter he kept in his pack. And there's the real time as he went compilation of where he went. And as you can see, when he's going on the road, we're losing signal here. But on this bit, even at the back, we were picking up the signal. So it's fine. Just again, showing that <coughs> here, the sort of data we can get reliably off these things. There's just two sheep with a colour each. And what we were finding is that the data drop off by Laura was mirror imaging each other, even though they're in quite unlikely long big sort of environment. So it doesn't look to my mind like that was GPS data acquisition, it was something about the communication out, because that was mirroring each other. And the question is from a farmer, a rancher point of view, 95% is a lot, is a, is good data. Should we be worried about the 5% we're missing? If it's five minutes long, I don't know. But it's just saying there are issues with, with, with missing new cycles. So, question, maybe pick up at the end. So the question is, what can we use precision ranching? What can we use GPS for in this long? Is it useful as a, as a thing? Or would it, does it fit together something else? Very quickly now about, uh, keep moving. 
They've been looking at using proximity data, because the issue we've got is mothering up father to daughter, easy, one round in the field, mother to daughter, quite different in the air sensor system, because the only time you can catch this lamb is when it's a few hours old, and then case you can get that environment, occasionally that issue will come all the way up, but usually she's 20, 30 metres away at the most, and then we use a tag that we tie on to use a pair of binoculars to identify that sheep. And then the, then the lamb's tag goes back. If you get to that point there, nobody would catch that lamb. Even, even dogs wouldn't catch a lamb like that. They would just go round and round and so. So how do we do that? Well, the conventional approach is to, recent conventional, see DNA and send samples away. Historically to New Zealand, but now in the UK, but it's costing about 10, 10 13 dollars a head. So it's quite expensive. So one of the issues is, and we've looked at We've used these proximity measures like the, the search track stuff that you guys have had here, but we've been looking at Bluetooth as an opportunity to do something there. So we've been kind of doing work with views with a real time LoRa communication out, and then a, a Bluetooth receiver here. And these are two lamps, each with a Bluetooth beacon, like you've all got in your phones. And what we've got there is we've got uh, eight views and 18 lamps. Ignore the numbers aren't quite right, but all all the twins were with those with the, with the eight, but with, with, with a couple more of random lambs on. And this is one use data for a short period of time. And these are all these are the contacts we recorded. So those are the two lambs. And that can look like it's two a day in two days we can get that information out really quickly. And even this is again showing some about the quality of information and how they the data measure called RSS, which is single, single strength, tells you that the better the contact, it's more likely to be the, the, the pearl lamb rather than a foreign lamb that's got close. So there's something about quality of contact there. Now, so that's a commercial service being sold in, in, in America, <coughs> sorry, America, Europe. Okay. In Australia, uh, something called Smart Shepherd. Um, I can't work out whether they've, they've sold one of these things or a thousand of them, but they they claim some success in terms of actually doing this. So you can move the kit on from one one, one lot of sheep to the next to get data. So we can then move from a breeding flock of 100 sheep to 1,000 sheep, and that's a gen power quantity better. So proximity, I think, are good opportunities. We'll pick up that later. Maybe in terms of resource use, as well as where else. Because it is cheap and cheerful technology. And we'll get you one of these, um, these loggers. They're using it to track young people, in, or people going through small stadiums, seeing where they go. In terms of giving them out and getting them back. Anyway, move on. So the next bit, a little bit of story a bit about, well, this is the sort of like, this is the motion sensor story. So livestock have pretty boring lives. They're quite normal in days when you're all the same. And then there are occasional days when things can go badly wrong. Um, but most of the rest of the days are pretty good. And what we try to pick out is the outlier thing one way or other. And also ill animals have our outliers as well. So there we are. So what we did here was actually ask the question, rather than trying to use the motion sensors which are in all our phones to work out what the animal's doing precisely, they just look at rhythms in terms of activity as a general sense. So this is actually the total amount of motion the animal's having within blocks of two minutes, all accumulated up across different <coughs> months of the year, different periods of the year. So this is February, this is after, after lambing, this is in late, Lactation, this is in the autumn. Blue is the sun, sunrise and sunset. Again, from our interest, we are as far north as the bottom end of Alaska. <coughs> um, so, um, quite a long way. So, we have, we have a big difference in the light dark. And uh, you can see that in the dark, in the, in the winter, they're doing quite a lot of activity. Again, down here. And they're grazing. So, they're grazing in the dark. They can't see what we're eating. But within it, they have quite good periods. They're getting some feeding going on here, so that creates a bit of noise in the middle, but the rest of it is quite, quite, quite constant. Quite normal, so then a bit of rest in the middle. So the question is, can you pick out things in, troublesome things in their lives by that? Well, yes, we can. We've got paper out that's basically looking at their data, looking at the average motion index, can I compare one data index with the previous week's worth of data and saying, is the animal now changed its approach? And getting some variations. So we've done some <coughs> very, very, very easy data to look at, but bottom side shows that 
point on day eight, it started raining. And it stopped raining six days later. So that's how it raining. It doesn't come in an hour, it comes up days and days. And that's it. This is the rolling average of the amount of rain we got because it matches the rolling average of the, the, the seven day sensor takes out. So what happened is these animals were, they had a very low level of variation until the weather turned up. And then the weather turned up and they, they, they stuck in and went to hell. But what we also found that some animals here, the bottom half, they were more disturbed by than others. And their return to normality went off the edge of the grass. Looking at that across the quarters, we found that that sort of approach told us something. And one died there, and two died there. We were predicting death by looking at the, the off coloredness of their sheep in terms of their rhythmicity in, that, in, that, in, this, in this study here. Um, just for something as simple as that motion center. So that's something different than trying to pick it apart and do that. So that's just another example of it there. So this is, this is in summer, and we're looking at something that looks at body weight change again, some element of predictability about body weight gain in that period. I don't want to bore you with it, it works. So they, 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 they can produce amounts of data, but what do you do with it? It's one of the issues. So in extensive system, maybe the answer is to look at the big picture rather than the narrow picture. I don't borrow too much of that. So the question is, if it goes for much time, is it worth it? Is one of the big issues that's out there. How do we work it through? I'm going to jump a bit now towards the, the second, second half, the last bit, because I want to do the last bit better, and therefore miss some of this out. But one of the issues is, is it worth it? So we're going to pick that up. So I'm just whispering some of these things here, because that, that problem of, of um, how well the system works and Accurate or not? So this 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 sort of um, uh, question is there. So we have a situation where getting the right answer is important, but getting wrong answers has, has implications for people and their and their and their how much they like the thing. So if you get lots of false alarms, they get really really upset. So just uh, we'll go back. I can read some of that, but there are costs to all these bits of it. Every bit of a system which is got sensitive isn't all about gain. It's, it's actually about gains and costs. And the people who sell the kit will always emphasize the gains, not the cost. So I'm going to move past that as well. But that's one question. Does it change our, our approach? It's going to go to a thing here. We've got to know where, yeah, that isn't something we commonly see anymore in our extensive systems. How do we, how do we replace the, the, the kit with that? And if you start with reducing the amount of input from the line of the kit, does that create problems? So just, there's a couple of slides that can even come out later. But certainly, we have, in a sense, in the animal welfare legislation in the UK and Europe, if we don't do things, because we don't know. The point at the moment in your ranching system if something goes wrong, you don't know about it, so you can't do anything about it. As soon as you put a bit of kit on them that tells you something's wrong and you ignore it, <coughs> you're potentially saying, you should have done something about that. So it's one of the issues, and I suspect the American got a slight history with the, legislative, with, with, the, with the law, which is, yeah. So people sue everybody, well, is that not true? <laughs> So it's one of the interesting issues about whether we data becomes a problem. So we'll move past that, but certainly it's one of the issues about how we deal with that. So we have the animal, this is actually some, uh, some collars who were put on by some people from America, and we'd be trying to find them to sue them. Um, but they put these collars, they gave them us to put on, and we actually, for the first time ever, we got some, we got some swords under the, under the net because some other fool didn't tighten the collar. And then some other fool like me, who was actually on the ethics committee, I had to go report the fact that I was called allowing this man here to put collars on our sheep. You know, I mean, it could have been, yeah. But the, the, the court case gone on forever. But, uh, but seriously, the animal there suffered because we didn't get it right. Um, and, you know, it, it, it just because we didn't, we hadn't tested this out, we just got buckles that were causing us a problem. They, these weren't your, these were the other ones. So you're okay. I remember, I remember that. Yeah, these are the other people's buckles. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so there is quite a lot there that's, that's, that's potentially happening with that. Okay, I'm going to move on to the transformational story. Just the, the, the virtual banking story to finish off. I'll keep going five minutes to do that. I can't even. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that clock over there. It says I haven't got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got this technology allows us to know where animals are. We, we know what some of the things that they're doing, but truthfully, we're not managing them. We just they just tell me where they are. 
the, the next story on is where we can actually start doing something. So, some people have got the idea of opening gates to allow them through fences into the next top paddock, some sort of rotational grazing with a, with a control system that may be automated, or more fashioning like that, but just using conventional fences. Um, and, and, and the likes of like, getting alerts, but this situation now is we don't move on to a story where you combine that mapping approach with, 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 with GPS based um, collars um, to a shot collar. This is a commercial dog shot collar. Yeah. I think that's now illegal in most, much of Europe, all of Europe, I think, but right through, through. But um, it's a way of actually you know, telling the animal it's come outside a certain. Range or wherever you just shot it in one about. Combine those two together, can we actually get persuade animals to stay inside an invisible fence or a, or a virtual fence? And quite a lot's happening in this, this world again. It's something you know we know quite well. We're quite involved in it. Um, so as far as I'm aware of today, there are four global companies working on this. The Shepherd and Gallagher, who've now taken them over there, are now on 51% of, of that company. And Gallagher's are quite big over here in electric fencing, believe. So they, they're working out of Australia and New Zealand mainly. Vence is a, some New Zealanders working out of California. Hulk and some New Zealanders are working out of New Zealand, mainly on dairy cows. And no fence and, and Norwegians working out of Norway. Um, it's quite a lot of effort in UK to get some UK people working on UK, but nobody really could bite the bullet to go for this thing. Because at the moment, I calculate there's over 100 people working quite hard on getting the technology out there. So quick sums. $30,000 a year, that's $30 million a year being invested in getting virtual fencing technology out. So I think, and most of these people aren't just doing for fun, they, they aim to make money. Which is interesting. I don't think they're competing with each other either, because they're looking at different spaces and different different regions, different technologies. Everybody's using LoRa to do the communication, except this lot we're using the mobile phone setup, uh, sorry, the cell phone setup to connect it with. So this is telling you a little bit about this, because this is the, the other, I think it's really difficult, challenging sometimes to work out the economics, the, the, the cost benefits of some of the other kit. This, I think, is where the costs are higher, but the benefits are immense in terms of doing something different. So in really simple terms, sorry, I do simple well. <laughs> we have a collar, there's a chin strap on here below it, but that goes around, I think there's a solar panel here to help. But that's basically communicated with, with the cell phone to, to, to mark out the fence. Up, down, down, around that, that thing I showed before. Put on the cow. The cow then is being picked up by the GPS receiver, just like they've all those are when we go out hiking. And it moves in the virtual pipe towards the virtual fence. And like the shock collar in the dog, it gets an electronic pulse, not a shock. Pulse that gives it a warning signal. And as it gets near it, it may, some of them go up and some of them change. And then it gets an electric pulse that it it picks up and they, a lot of times out of 100, they turn around and go back. And they learn that in this program. And I've seen it work and it works, mainly video and I'll show you that in a minute if I can. But that's basically the, the simple principle and that's controlled by, by somebody at the force. The benefit of that is you also, as well as getting the control, you're also getting the where's my cow approach that you're actually seeing on your, on your phone. Dots on maps, alerts, and all that stuff. So you've got this capacity to manage the grazing without a fence and without you being there. They seem like quite big ticks in any environment where, we, where we're grazing animals. We're currently with wire. And indeed, anywhere where wire is so expensive, you don't do it. So you have large paddocks here, which some people think we should have these sort of, um, uh, what's it called? It was a grazing system around here where you move them rapidly. Sort of the, uh, hmm? the holistic fencing needs. The uh, um, Helen Savory approach, if you that makes sense. That was my signal from home saying, shut up, can't you? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Anyway, these, these are the global companies there and what they're doing and they're moving around. So, this is quickly the biggest problem is yeah. who are these people can you Which I don't mean that's true. If you do that, you'd be doing quite well. So coming back there's the benefits of looking at the bottom of this, they can be partly autonomous because they don't have to connect to the internet all the time because they can store on board and work like your your sat map as well you can't pick up stuff. So they give you the dots on map to tell you what's going on. 
So you can see whether you should interact or not. But you can also use them to virtual herd, which is to <coughs> bring the animals in. Move them, move them from one paddock to the next, one virtual paddock to the next virtual paddock, and or bring them in. So gather them up maybe two or three days, rather than sending a helicopter and going all that sort of stramash and stuff, and having people involved who don't know what they're doing because you need extra people in, just programming the system and say, three days time I want the cattle in the bottom paddock. And you can ask the question, why won't it work, rather than will it work? Because I think that's where we're moving to. And you do the split cattle off. So the, the whole of people see it as a way they can actually get cattle to go left and right coming out of the dairy pile. So we can go into that paddock or that paddock so then those ones can be served or somebody can check their feet or whatever, rather than to bring the whole lot in put them through a, through, a, through a handling system. So potentially things. And everybody in these systems is bundling all the other stuff I've talked about today in there as well. So motion sensors, GPS, visualization, all that lot's going in there. So that, that's what you're going to get. You're getting the full package of this thing in more old fashioned fashion and charging for it. So that's where we're at. So let's just move on to the thing. So you can see some elements of that happening there. Virtual paddock. Animals go near the edge of it, they get warm, they come back. Move them on wherever that's a super hard work. And just to illustrate the fact we've done some of this stuff, but without the virtual, we've done with some steam driven technology with an induction cable. There's an example just to show you the. There, so here's a virtual paddock here, that's a virtual fence line, cattle here, green grass to the side of it, it works. Sorry, can you believe that? If you see that in the field, you go, it's working. You know cattle, we know cattle. They wouldn't, if they didn't want to, they wouldn't stay this, if they weren't persuaded to, they wouldn't stay this side of the line. And, and there's some data from, from, from near London, where there's the one experiment happening currently in the last year in, 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 with the snow fence technology there in UK, the rest are in Norway. But that's again the location. There's a little bit of a fuzzy boundary there. Cattle go over it. But again, all these people have got the systems. The cattle go, if the cattle want to go through, they let them go. So they don't they literally accelerate. So they turn off the kit of the cattle as food and then lasso them back slowly but surely to the back where they should be. Cattle want to return to their pals anyway. So it, it, it seems to, seems to work. And again, the sophistication they're all trying to build into it is part of the reason these things are not on the market today. But there's, there's some data from, 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 from New Zealand. That's the virtual boundary there. That's a conventional fence with an offset of a virtual boundary along it to stop the cows breaking the fence. So you can just preserve that hard fence for another 10 years by keeping the cow off it. Um, so that proves it works in my mind. You know, those fish. And that's, like, that's lots of, these are those data points over several, several days. There aren't any anywhere else. I've got time to show the video, and then I'll stop, I think. That's okay. I've got to work out. Never mind how to do it. I'm going to show you a cow. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. There's, a, there's a short period of just watching the, the, the behavior of this cow in Norway. Sorry, I'm going to do that. As it comes up to the, so there's a bit. I asked for a short clip rather than a longer clip, so the rest of it. So here's a cow with a with a with a, with a no fence um, collar around its neck. It's actually a chain because they like cowbells in kind of the Europe. It's now moving through the buffer zone. It's probably getting tall. You're getting close. You're getting close. You're getting close. 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 And now she got shot. The point about that is it's all quite low key. It isn't actually. Anybody who's thinking about cattle goes, that's not, that's not the equivalent of hitting more of the face with a half a pipe. It, it's, it, it's sort of low key and it works. So the proof is it works, but it also is quite good there. So in terms of PR, one of the main important. We're avoiding the word that's got shocking in it, saying use pulse or stimuli, but also the view of this is better than real fencing. And the, because we're taking the people out of it as well. So actually, in terms of herding the cattle, watch it again. The cattle get moved and pushed, they just look much happier than when somebody's basically pushing them. They're almost being led rather than pushed. And, and all that low, low stress thing seems to be quite interesting. So, to finish, the question is for the future ignoring money and ignoring cost benefit, which is the sort of thing costs are or aren't everything. What's going to stop this happening? Especially when you can see something like that that's really going to change things rather than just give you 
more hassle. Like some of this stuff may just give you, oh, I've got to go check my tails because there's a signal that says there's something wrong. But this just sort of stuff might be the way we're moving to where we generally see people being able to run their farm from Honolulu, I don't know, but with somebody doing the sort of cross checks. So, what do you think? Convinced? Not convinced? I don't know. So, so I think I should stop there. I'll go back to this one now. Go back to the slides, but that I think's my. I spent a lot of time doing more than I should have done. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm just going to cut this out. You know, Do you want to put the point over here? I'm just going to have it there just in case I need it. Oh, okay. I have a couple more slides, but I'm not going to show them. Very good. Just, you can't do too much. Very good. Fine. So, thank you, Tony. Thanks a lot. So, we. <laughs> We have six minutes for questions. So, uh, so that's I should have run it down to two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, excellent. Um, have, have you, not, not just in your work, but in general in this whole field of research, have you been able to map some of these technologies to the profit cycle to see where they're going to? What well, could potentially have an impact either on yeah. increased production or decreased production I mean, cost? Or I, I, I think one of the things to ask this question why would people adopt any sort of new technology any change? And money is now, I think, as you know, in these sort of worlds, if, if farmers were good at economics, they wouldn't be farming. Appreciate it. Appreciate they would be doing something else which they, yeah, when, when, when it makes a difference. There, there are elements of their life is really important. So I've done some cost benefit because I've helped film the grant forms, which you'd like to say, let's put a value proposition in there for some of the sort of locations that are saying, where's my town? And it's actually quite a challenge to, you can see some benefit, but the, what is challenging to say is the, what the cost. You know, it takes time to put colours on it, it takes time to find colours that fall in the pasture. If things break, you've got to mend them. You know, so it's quite a challenge. When you look at this stuff, where you've got something you're replacing, a real fence that you either already have, these are internal fences, not external fences, or something you would like but you can't afford, then you can do a bit more of that. And then it starts to work out pretty close. Somebody asked the other day whether the costs are going to come down. I don't think these guys are going to bring the cost down because what we're going to do is let no smartphone I ever know the cost never came down. They kept adding an extra bell and whistle on. And say, so look at the new improved blah, 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 because they've got to make, they've got to make a profit out of this. So I think we built it. $60, $60, $70, but they're going to sell it to you for 200 plus. If you if you try to sell this to the industry, they're probably not interested. Well, I think now they are. Well, I mean, the, the overarching industry, because it's not going to increase production. If you try to sell it to farmers, they would be interested, because it's labor saving. It's labor, it's labor saving and, and, and better. It's an interesting comment. I think we're interested more in, the, in, 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 in this technology. Just remember that conversation when Two guys met in wherever Silicon, Silicon Glen, and the other one said, Just tell me again, you want to put a camera in a phone? <laughs> no, are you sure? You know, and, and how many people are going to buy this? So it's, we're in that world, and I know from the contacts we've had with real, real farmers, and, and, and especially sort of the, the funny end of farming, the conservation end, and the, the people who've got other interests and purely just, just books per pound of beef or whatever the right term on is. Um, that they are interested in these other values of things you can get. Farmers are also really keen on on, on just uh, the, the, the assurance you get out of this, that they'll know what's going on rather than the worry. And I know that's something I'm running. A lot of the time they don't do things because they're frightened of what the implication will be. And that's why the kit that the, just where the cow is is really valuable in our environment. Because of the fear that if the cow gets into the bottom bit down there, then that dog from there will be a problem. So let's not let it go down there. Or if we do, if it's heading, or we're heading that direction, we'll just go down, ease the back, no virtual collar. So I think all those things. So when you do the hard cut economics, you can just work out how much the fence costs on farms. I'll, I'm going to show you if you want them later, but I've got some cost benefits for fencing costs. And our, some of our medium sized upland farms in SRUC, we're spending between 10, no, $13,000 and 26000 dollars a year on fencing. If we could halve that, there's a pot of money that would, would go in this, and the, the last 10 years, you can suddenly go, oh, well, actually, that's 100,000 quid worth of kit, and we could put that on a quarter of our boom. So on that part of the farm, it sort of works out. But it's, it's tight, so I think it was the people who see value in it and who are willing to, who are looking for the lifestyle benefits as well as the, the pennies. 
Good with you. Are, are there areas where that signal can't be, oh, yeah, sure. like remote areas, because we have places where we can't get So through. communication is still an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. So I've got lot, half of Scotland and the rest can't get mobile phone coverage away from the roads in the countryside. So the top of mountains you're fine, near the road you're fine, in between it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. So that's why Laura's fitting in, because basically we, we're providing our own Network. So, so right, using the mobile phone network and paying people for it, open source, your own basically local radio system is, is the option. But actually, then some creates problems. You've got to put them in the right place. So that's a low cost ish option, but it's still not without it. Look, low, these, these are so real satellites, but cheap satellites. So the problem with Aaron Musk et al. are going to put up these low cost, low altitude ones, hundreds of them, thousands of them, but I suspect they'll cost them. And their cost will probably link to something like people with boats. And cars, <coughs> cars, and people can't buy them unless can't afford it. So, so there will be still issues of well, it may work, but can't we afford it? But communication and doubt is a problem. But the moment before we did this, once the cow got you know Wi-Fi, you remember Wi-Fi ten years ago, you couldn't even use it in your house. Now you at least you can use it in your cattle shed. So to go beyond it is 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 a thing. You guys are using repeaters to get you a little bit further out in the system to go beyond here, but you can't cover a, the sort of farms. I don't think you cover any of the farms you've got. That I know of with that sort of technology, yeah, but there may be some. some yeah. no, 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 no. Um, I've heard of recent efforts with drones that can essentially take the temperature of a herd. Any of these sensors? Are they trying to include like temperature? Or yeah, well, yeah, well, temperature is interesting because obviously it's, in, it's internal temperature is interesting, not external temperature. Um, one of the tags I showed on there was a calf tag. And it's, they call it a fever tag or something like that. I think that's the actual terminology. But anyway, animals, your animals are much more likely to show these issues than can be done. And, and, and external body temperature is, is an indication of problems inside as well. So, yeah, <coughs> all these bits of kit, sorry, your mobile phones got a temperature. They're so cheap that by and large they put them in even if they don't want them into this kit. So they've got, they've got temperature sensors and you can get the data out. Um, what it means is an interesting issue because if it's on if it's a mirror on the outside, what does it mean? But it can, it can tell you something about the external temperature, but potentially tell you something about the animal as well. But certainly on the calves using barn systems looks like a potentially useful thing that picking up you know, fever, you know, quite serious things will, will have a small effect on the on the temperature you can pick it up. Yeah. Again, somebody again using internal internal systems much more. Um, the fact that something is snake oil doesn't mean there's not a market for it. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I don't think that's a good assumption at all. <laughs> Just go with it. No, I, I'll tell you that. I mean, the, the key thing is when you when you ask when you ask a bunch of farmers whether it's going to work, the fact that half of them say it's a complete waste of time is irrelevant. Just talk to people and say, well, maybe because there may be is a massive market. I mean, the market for this sort of stuff, you think, I, we, we start quite a lot time to work down what the, the value of wire was in the fencing systems, and you're into billions of dollars a year. So if you start nibbling away at that, that's right. So a company called Galleries, who currently work in wire, have bought up 51% of this Ashton's company. They've not done that by accident. They go, wire, things are past. Where, where are we going next? So that's clearly, they've done those sums, and they're um, even with their investment, they, can, they, 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 they should be looking at it. We'll see. I, you know, I, in all the things I've seen, the benefit of this, the, the end product is. I think knowing where cattle are, if you did cheaply enough, is really valuable to the portion of the market. You just can't you, currently spend hours in trucks or walking to see stuff, or stopping what they're doing, and therefore it will allow them to graze stuff where they currently wouldn't, or be forever worried about what's going on. So, I mean, we've got dozens and dozens of people who would buy this kit tomorrow in the UK. It's not yet available. So it, it will be. I'm still in 2017. This bit of kit will be available next year. It didn't make it. But now I think we're moving to this The momentum's so big that it's going to happen. I think those technological issues of batteries and power saving and, and the software and all that stuff is sort of coming together that, that why wouldn't it happen as long as they get the marketing story thing? The, the no offense people are quite interesting. They've, 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 they go around, they've sold 6,500 we've called to people with goals, domestic goals, based on the basis we can solve some of our teething problems with people with goals. Because if they make a mess of the market for goals in Norway, it's not the end of the world. But 
that way they basically avoid the mess in the, in the cattle market. So they do all their teething problems, deal with that, and then they basically take the same column, make it bigger, and they improve the software stuff like so we can do a cattle launch this year, which they aim to launch in Norway and the UK. And we've got 10,000 more cattle than they've got, and the US obviously ignored too. So they're ready to move on if I went. We've no. I'm, okay, I'm just curious. Did each company have its own satellites up there, or do they like rent based on? No, well, well, the, 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 right. The, the virtual fancy people or people using GPS based, they're all using public stuff. So you, you don't. Who owns the GPS satellites? The, the U.S. Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, GPS is owned by them. You know, public goods. You know, for that. So, so the, the core satellites provide the data. It's provided by. European Union, Russia, you need to be careful, and, and the US, okay? And people turn this thing off, it's one of the issues that's, that's out there. So that's, the, that's where the data comes from. The, 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 the moving data from the animal to the cloud, who owns the cloud? Right. Facebook and all these things. But again, what's happening is now is public source data. So <coughs> this last couple of few days, we're looking at um, one of the big networks, which is called the Things Network. And basically, the people buy you that sell you the centre of the kit in, uh, taking a bit of money off you and, and, uh, uh, and providing money for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you get free use of the infrastructure because you paid for it as part of the licence for the, for the bit of kit. You don't use it, so you don't have a charge for it. It's free. But there's a money circulating by the point is that they will send enough money that they, you know, they, they took on the internet of things, the five billion things. Well, they, these car, these tags will just be part of that same thing. So the hardware definitely has to be bought and paid for, but the, the networking is just going to be part of that internet of thingy things. You know, if you buy a fridge with an uh, internet of things in, are you paying for the server somewhere? You probably are, but you don't know it. But you're not paying for the data transfer, like you do when you're using your cell phone. So that, that transaction is being taken out. Some people are using unique, some of the people in this sort of space, I'll use that jargon, and mm -hmm. I've got their own networks and they are Making exclusive networks so that other people can't just sort of jump in. So there's a, there's a communication set up called Sigfox, which uses slightly different frequencies for different things. And they've got their own dedicated, you can only you can put it through. And also, they're also offering some level of data security. Yeah. I mean, if these, these are built, if you think about this, for somebody to hack the system and steal your cows, you could actually physically imagine a system where they, they roll up two days on from now with a truck. At the far end, and the cows are already there because you've broken in and shifted the cows. If he does it, I thought you were trying to go to that. So, are there global plans to keep that green? I think the more one that watches it, I think these are things world, which is this is tiny element of it. We clearly are concerned about how they deal with that. But you know, imagine something turns of all the refrigerators in New York for a couple of days. You know that would be that would that would be a meltdown of the world, wouldn't it? You know, now, I don't need to do that, but you know, but they could turn off the telecommunications. So, so protecting the, all that infrastructure isn't a problem for for a few farmers. It's a problem for the U.S. government. That's what I yeah. Yeah. So we just this this space, I think, is a same issue. It's, it's a small part of that same issue. So companies are relying on some of this has also got to be about security. I mean, it's actually quite. You can't. You know. Yeah. The point is. I couldn't break it back, sometimes can't work up the kit that we're supposed to work. <laughs> so, but there will be people who can, but why would they? You know, why would they? Until it is the, the, the view that they, I mean, let's again give you the example where it does work. So at the moment they're hacking into, so, so, uh, poachers are hacking into GPS equipment on endangered species to find them and shoot them. So if you put a bit of kit on to help you protect the rhino, so you know where the rhino is. Somebody else goes, well, there's a rhino. I'll go now and shoot the rhino and take its home because I've now got a signal for it. So it has got really potential implications for, for bad use as well. But the moment we're on the side, I will. All right. So thank you all for your presentation.